All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, my name's Eric Finch. I'm a former USCS adjudicator and a former uh, Department of State Consular Officer. I'm working here at Boundless Immigration Rapid Visa. And uh, we're doing another Q&A today to talk through uh, something very specific, uh, student visas. So before I get started, I just want to make the usual disclaimer. I am uh, not a lawyer, not an immigration lawyer. Uh, what we talk about today is not legal advice. Uh, if you have questions specific to your situation and you want legal advice, please uh, find a, a certified professional in your area to assist you. They're the, work, they're the people who can tell you about a lot of specific questions that you may have about your individual situation, okay? But, um, you know, because of my experience in the government and uh, the things that I've done up to, till now at Boundless, I feel like I have a lot of good information to share about the process in general and uh, how the system works. And I want to share that with you today. While I am talking, anybody who has a question or wants to uh, follow up on anything that I've said, please just put a, uh, a question in the chat and I will either get it or I will share it with, uh, or one of my colleagues will share it with me so we can address your specific question, okay? All right, so to get started, you know, we're in the middle of the summer. It is, uh, you know, we're, we're some, depending on where you're at in the world, uh, you know, a lot of COVID restrictions have eased. Um, you know, the numbers for student visas issued by the Department of State have gone back up to pre-pandemic levels in the last year or two. So, uh, you know, a lot of people out there around the world want to come to the United States to study. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Some people just want to learn English uh, and they, you know, feel like America is a good place to do it. Other people want to go to one of our world-class universities or colleges. Some people come here for uh, secondary school or, you know, to, to attend high school and get a, get a head start on a possible college admission to a U.S. university. So all those things are great reasons to get interested in a student visa. But um, I think it's really important that while we, you're making that student visa decision, you have all the information you need about the process so that you can know the timelines, when you should start to think about applying, what schools and things uh, you know, are, are available, and um, what happens after you get admitted into your school and uh, you know, start the visa process, okay? So um, let's kind of start at the beginning and then uh, we'll kind of walk through it step by step, okay? So if you are abroad and you're interested in studying in the United States, there's a couple of different options, right? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those options in terms of like what visas are allowed uh, or associated with those options. So the, the primary visa that most people use to attend school in the States is an F-1 visa. Now the F-1 visa allows you to engage in a program of study at a U.S. Um, secondary school or university. You can't go to a public high school or secondary school. You can attend a private institution. Now, when you get to college at the undergraduate level, you can attend either a public or private institution. And of course, you'll pay tuition uh, that you know, the school charges. And um, it, you know, it's not automatic that you can just attend one of these programs. You need to apply. You need to go through the requirements and the process with the school that you've chosen to make sure that you can meet those requirements and be eligible for their program. And uh, once that school agrees to enroll you in the program, every school in the United States that is accredited um, and that chooses to issue visas for foreign students will have the capability to issue what they call a Form I-20. And that Form I-20 is what allows, is what tells the Department of State that you have been accepted into a program and you're eligible to apply for a student visa. Now, that doesn't mean you'll get the student visa approved because there's all kinds of other eligibility requirements uh, from the Department of State that would allow you to get that visa. And we'll go into that in a little bit. So if you have uh, applied for a program and you have that I-20 form or it's on its way, then you can begin the process of getting your visa appointment set up. Before we talk about that, let's just kind of hit a couple of the other visas and talk about how they're different from the F visa. And then we'll talk about the application process. So uh, the other visa, which is a bit lesser known, is the M visa. The M visa was created you know, around the time uh, after September 11th so that uh, the U.S. government could more accurately track people who are doing non-traditional forms of academic study, right? So people are going to pilot school, people are going to vac vocational school, uh, people who are learning a trade. They wanted to have a different category for those and be able to make sure that those people, you know, had the proper visa and they were able to, you know, re receive the proper permission to go to the United States and they could tell, tell where they're studying. So, yeah, a lot of those institutions will have the capability to also issue an I-20 form, and that I-20 form will reflect the fact that the program is not a traditional academic program at a, at a university or high school. Um, uh, but besides that distinction, they work almost exactly the same way for the visa process. So if you have an F visa, if you have an M visa, you'll get an I-20, you'll you know go to your country's uh, closest U.S. consulate or embassy, you'll make an appointment, attend an interview, and then you'll you know hopefully get your visa. 
All right, the one uh, one visa that falls under student visa that is actually quite different from the other two is the J visa. So the J visa is set up more as a program for academic exchange. Now that doesn't mean that you trade places with a specific person, but it, it allows for different institutions, including universities, to set up programs that allow them to bring over people for short periods to participate in academic or cultural exchanges, exchange programs, uh, work as au pairs, uh, receive certain types of training. There's a number of different categories for the J visa. And, uh, you know, usually those programs, instead of you, it, it's still important that you, you know, make some effort to go and identify a program that you would like to participate in. But most of the time, those programs are, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come from your school or they'll recruit you or they're part of an existing program between, you know, maybe the university that you're attending abroad and the U.S. university. So for those, once you get uh, enrolled in the program, it, it, you are, you're issued a different form, and that form uh, is called a DS-2019, and that's a Department of State form. And yeah, it, it looks different, uh, usually two or three pages instead of a couple, you know, the, 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 the format looks different. Uh, you remember that I forms, usually forms that begin with an I, are usually Department of Homeland Security forms, whereas forms that come from the Department of State are usually begin with a DS. So in this case, it's a Department of State form issued by their designated sponsor organizations that, that create and support these exchange programs. And that, that document will also be required for you to, to schedule and attend a J visa interview. Now, one, th one more thing before we go into the, the visa interview process, and then I'll look and see if we got any early questions. So, um, the, the, the visas, you know, are, are the, the requirements for these visas in, in these documents that they give you are very important. And unlike a lot of stuff in life today, like you can't walk around with a copy in a lot of cases, you need to have the original. So you need to take care of and make sure that you hang on to that original I-20 form or that DS-2019 form. You're going to need to show it when you uh, apply for your visa. You're going to need to get it signed for the DS-2019 at your visa interview or when your passport gets passed back to you. You need to carry the original copy with you to the United States because they look at it again when you enter the country. And then, yeah, you'll, you'll need that every time you enter and leave, even after you get your visa, you'll also be required to show that paperwork. So it's a very important that you keep, keep track of those documents and make sure that they're up to date and they have the proper signatures and things when you travel. Okay, so that's uh, our early ones. Um, before I get into the visa interview, let me just look and see what questions we have here. Okay, so I, we, we do have one question about how to extend a visa. So I will tackle that question. Let me get a little bit further along in the process. So let's talk about the student visa interview. All right, so you applied to and were accepted into a program. You've made an appointment. You go to the embassy or the consulate, and now you have to attend an interview. And what is this interview really about? Um, well, you know, it's the Department of State, like, you know, like tourist visas and other types of visas, you know, they're required to do an in-person interview for a lot of these different visa types, right? And, uh, you know, there's a couple of different purposes, right? They have to make sure that you're eligible, that you overcome some of the U.S. laws that say that we have to prove that people aren't going to immigrate if we give them these, these visa types. And you also have to show that you have the financial and social support to succeed in your program. You know, the U.S. doesn't want to give people visas and send them to the United States if they're not going to succeed in, their, in what they're trying to do there. Now, that, that question is a little easier to answer for tourists. You know, they just want to go on a vacation, see what's going on in, you know, some part of America and then come back into their country and pick up where they left off. Now, students are quite different, right? Because like for a lot of student visa programs, you will be in the United States for you know, years, sometimes several years, right? Depending on your program. A lot of people will go, you know, high school, college, um, may, may attend like a graduate program, go into like a postdoc program. So this can stretch out for several years, right? And uh, that's fundamentally like quite a different conversation. And uh, that, that, that will be a function somewhat of what your forms say for your program, right? Like if you're going into a four-year undergraduate program, that's the kind of conversation that you're going to have with the consular officer. If you're going for a J program for six months, that's a little bit different, but still some of the same questions may be asked. So I think in a lot of cases, you know, you, you, you need to kind of like look at those forms and think about your program in order to be able to perform this visa interview correctly. So you'll go to your visa interview and the consular officer usually ask you like, uh, several, several questions, you know, like all visa interviews for the non-immigrant visas, it's a pretty short interview. They'll probably give you about, you know, one and a half to three minutes. Uh, and in that time, you really need to make sure that you can convince the consular officer that what you're planning to do makes sense, that you're financially able to support yourself or you have help from other people like your family. And that, you know, uh, give, uh, you know, unless something changes, you'll return back to your country when you're finished. Now, I know that sounds a little strange because a lot of people get student visas and then 
you know, perform their program and, and find another way to work in the United mm-hmm. States. And that's where we'll get into the extension question a little bit. So uh, let's the visa interview, like I said, you know, is really pr- mostly focused on the, th- the three things that I mentioned, which is um, what are you planning to do? Like, where's your program? Where's your school? How'd you pick that school? And then, you know, the financial element, which is most people is pretty simple, like either you have a scholarship or your family will pay, uh, you know, you just need to relate that truthfully to the consular officer. And then finally, they're going to think about like, look a little more holistically at what I call ties. And they're going to look at your, what you're doing in your own country, what your family's doing, what type of relatives and friends you have in the U.S. And just try to make an educated guess about like, if that, if they, if you receive that visa, will you use it appropriately or will you use it for something else? So you go to the interview, you discuss these questions with the officer. Um, they'll make a decision about whether you overcome the uh, INA 214B, which is the presumption of immigrant intent. If there's something missing from your case, in a lot of cases, they'll give you what they call an INA, INA 221G letter saying, like, we need to see additional paperwork or we're missing something. But if you don't have any of those problems and you don't have any other negative prior immigration history, then usually they'll go ahead and issue the visa. And uh, compared to tourist visas, student visas tend to get approved at a much higher rate, right? Because it's a benefit to the U.S., right? They have these people who are uh, outside the United States who want to come and spend money on, on, on a school program and study here and learn about our culture. So a lot of the people end up working in the United States. So it's a great way for the United States to capture highly talented and skilled like foreign workers. So, yeah, I think generally the U.S. government likes to approve these visas. It doesn't necessarily mean every single person will get one, but, you know, that's that's usually their inclination. So after the visa is issued, you receive your passport back. Remember, remember those forms because you do still need your I-20 and your DS-2019. So if you didn't get those things back from your interview or you, you know, waiting on to receive those from the consular officer at the embassy, you need to follow up and make sure you have those before you can travel. If you have the visa in your hand and you have the passport in your hand with the visa in it and your school forms that I talked about before, you're ready to go. Now, you can't enter the United States more than 30 days before your program begins. So that's why we're talking about this at this moment is a lot of folks you know, in August are going to travel to the United States. Hopefully they already have their visas. And uh, once they have those visas, you know, in the 30 days before their program starts, your program start date should be listed on your forms uh, that you received from your school. Um, you can travel to the United States. And then again, this is a, this is a semi-permanent move for a lot of young students. Uh, you know, you're going to have to find somewhere to live. Uh, maybe your university provides dorms or housing. Maybe you've decided to, you know, find a, a local residence. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to do. Open bank accounts, you know, maybe get a U- U.S. driver's license. You're going to have to get a cell phone plan. I mean, you're really starting a whole new life in the United States. And uh, the longer that your program is going to be, the more, you know, permanent these types of things are going to, are, are going to become. You might have to buy a vehicle. Uh, you know, there's a number of things that you're going to need to figure out. Now, when you travel to the United States, you're going to have to go through U.S. Customs. So you get on the plane, you fly to the U.S. at whatever airport in the U.S. that you land. You have to wait in line with your passport and your visa and your documents and uh, talk talk again to a U.S. government official, in this case, somebody who works for Customs and Border Protection. And, uh, you know, usually you won't have a problem if your visa was issued re- relatively recently. They'll just look at your paperwork again, check your visa, make a note that you entered the country, and then you're good to go. Once you enter the United States with the visa and you're given, you're granted entry by CBP, um, you, you, you're able to stay in the United States for as long as you continue to attend that academic program, right? Now, again, we've talked about this before on these Q&As where the visa is the visa and the time that you're given by CBP to be in the country is a separate thing. So you can have a five-year visa and you could be in a six-year program. Your visa may expire, but if you haven't left the United States, you're fine to stay in the United States after the visa expires uh, as long as you continue to attend the, the same academic program. Now, this, this, this what they call duration of status resets every time you ac- exit and re-enter the United States. And you always have to have a valid visa to enter the United States from overseas. So what happens for a lot of folks is they get a, say they get a one-year visa, right? That program's four years long. They may stay in the U.S. for two years and then decide to go back and visit mom and dad. Then that means because your visa expired after 12 months that you will have to get a new visa before, no, sorry, you will need to get a, a new visa before you can re- return to the United States to, be, to, to, be, to continue your program, okay? If that visa and your passport is not valid, you will not be let into the U.S., now, that, you know, and I think it's important that people make that distinction because a lot of people think, oh, okay, the visa means if I can stay as long as the visa is good. If, you're, if your visa is good for five years, but your program's only six months long, 
than what's going to happen after you try to enter the U.S. when the program has already expired. Yeah, you have a visa, but you don't have a valid I-20 or a valid DS-2019. CBP officer will find that and say, like, okay, no, just because you have a visa, if you're not planning to attend school, you can't use this visa to enter the U.S. So I want to create a strong distinction in everybody's minds about what these visas are and how they're used and what happens when you enter the United States with a visa. So you've got your visa, you went through customs, you're in the U.S., you're doing all these busy things to get ready for what's what's going to happen next, okay? And uh, again, from that point on, you shouldn't have to think about it too much, right? But it's important while you're in the United States to make sure that that visa you know, just stays valid. A lot of people get surprised when they don't pay attention to that, and then the visa has expired after they go on a trip. And it doesn't have to be back home. Even if you take a trip across the border down to Mexico to go shopping for a day, and you're a foreign student, if you don't have a valid visa and a valid passport and you're not attending an academic program, it's, there's a possibility you won't be let back in. You know, we see that happen with folks who go over to Canada sometimes who are living up in the Pacific Northwest or in the Northeast. You know, you need to be cautious and, and understand that, like, that doesn't matter where else you go. If you leave the United States, you got to have a visa to get back in. Um, so, yeah, make sure that your passport is in a safe place. Make sure your visa is in a safe place. Make sure that you have copies of those things on your phone or wherever else that you can show people who you know, don't need to see the actual original forms. And make sure that those things are all valid and up to date when you're planning to travel. If you think you're going to need a new visa, um, you know, time, wait times have gotten a little bit better. But it, you, you need to plan ahead in advance because even in a lot of countries still to this day, you know, there's 22 to three week waits for a visa appointment. You know, if you're going back home for a one week trip. You're going to need to schedule that appointment quite a bit in advance to make sure that you'll be able to attend that while you're, you know, overseas and, and get that visa back in your hands before you need to get back to school. One other thing that I'll mention for a lot of these programs is you can't really be late. And this makes sense, right? Because if you're attending a college, you can't just miss the first month of class. That You know, they'll disenroll you, right? So, you know, you need to arrive on, you know, you have 30 days grace period before the program starts to get there. But you need to be there and attending that program on day one or else you could have a problem, right? Because if the school sees you're not there, they can do something uh, that involves a system called SEVIS. Now, SEVIS program is run by ICE, uh, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. And SEVIS, you'll have to pay a SEVIS fee when you apply for your visa. And what that does is it creates like an account for you in a U.S. government tracking system that tells the government like what school you're attending, what the program's like, some other information about you. And that SEVIS number will follow you across, like, multiple programs and things that you attend. Um, you don't really have to do anything active to, like, maintain this SEVIS uh, status. But if the university sees that you're not attending, they will put a, a notation in the system saying, like, hey, this person was supposed to come to our school and they didn't show up. And then if that is what your status is when you go in for another visa or if you encounter, you know, American immigration officials inside the United States, they can force you to leave the country. Okay, so, they, you know, it's not... It's, it's one of those visas where, yes, of course, you have to use it appropriately to, like, enter and leave the United States, but you also have to make sure that you're in that status attending that, that school or another school if you're authorized to change schools, or else there's a danger that you could be identified as a person who's not using your visa appropriately and be, be asked to leave or be denied further entry into the United States. So I don't want to scare anybody, but, yeah, that's how it works, and you need to be cognizant that, like, there's something going on there with the school and the, and the U.S. government that's trying to verify that you're actually doing what you said you would do on that visa. Okay, so we got a few questions. There was a question about J-1 visa and extensions. So once you're in the, inside the United States, like I said, you know, that, that visa that does allow you to continue to attend school. And you can, under limited circumstances, change programs. So perhaps you finish one program, you're still on your visa. You know, you don't have to exit and leave the United States necessarily to, like, start up a new program as long as, like, there's no period in between where you're not attending school. This is something that you're going to work, work with the international students office at your school to verify. Okay. So there's got, usually every, every school that has international students will have sometimes for small schools, it may just be one person. Other big schools may have a whole office, but those people are required to you know, maintain your SEVIS status and talk to the government about what you're doing. And if you think you're going to change programs or change schools, you want to make sure you do that correctly by working with that international students office to get permission to do what you're planning to do, right? And that person can issue updated I-20s or updated DS-2019s. But if you need to extend your status or change your status uh, to a different visa type, like say you had an F visa and now you want to go into a J visa program, you have to file what they call a Form I-539, which is an application to extend or change your status. That is a form you file with USCIS, with USCIS inside the United States, and that will allow you to like receive extended permission 
to, uh, you know, to continue to like remain in the status that you were in or change to a different visa status. This is also what people do sometimes when they change from like, say you had an H-1B visa, but now you want to go back to school for a master's program and get an F-1, but you don't want to go all the way back home and apply again at the embassy. You can apply with USCIS. You pay a fee, you send in all the documents and evidence that you're going to actually have this new status, and then they'll give you, uh, you know, what they call an I-797 uh, approval notice that says like, hey, we've given this person permission to have a new status. And then, you know, until you get a new visa, that's your evidence that you're actually help, you know, allowed to do the thing that you're supposed to be doing, that you're, that you're now doing. Um, and it works, that, that works for any non-immigrant visa status in the U.S. You're going to need permission from the U.S. government to assume a new visa status um, if you're not planning to exit the country and, and apply for a new visa overseas. Okay, got a couple other ones here. Um, I'm getting a couple of like non-student visa related things and I'm happy to answer those. I like to do these Q&As and just answer people's questions and things like that. So before we shift gears and start talking about that with the little time we have left, just a couple more notes on the student visa uh, discussion. So yeah, the main two, two seasons for student visas are kind of the summer, which makes sense for people who are headed into the U.S. for the fall semester. And then there's also like a bit of a bump in the winter because some people go home for winter break and things like that. Their visa's expired and they need a new visa. Um, those are the high periods and like you can probably have a little bit longer wait time during those periods than you would in any other part of the year to get a student visa. Um, like I said, you can get that visa a few months ahead of time if you already have all your paperwork and you're ready to apply. Just remember that the visa, whatever the validity of the visa or the issue date, you, you, you have to make sure that you have your 30 days or less until the start date of your actual program before you travel to the U.S. So again, visa versus permission to go actually into the U.S. Um, and if you need to get your visa a little bit in advance and you want to do it early so you don't get caught in the long wait times, especially during the summer, like you're allowed to do that. And uh, you would just want to discuss that with the consular officer at your interview. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, I'll answer a couple other questions here. Any other student visa questions that pop up? Happy to talk about that. It, these are great programs. Uh, you know, there's there's huge variety. United States has like so many amazing schools where you can learn all kinds of like interesting things, you know, and I really recommend for folks who need help finding an academic program. You know, the U.S. government provides a lot of resources. U.S. colleges are really aggressive about recruiting foreign students because they also feel like this is a really positive like thing for their university to have. Um, a lot of big countries uh, that send a lot of uh, students to the U.S., like India or China, you may be able to find uh, education fairs or other events in your local area where the colleges send representatives out to like kind of talk to you person to person so that you can answer your questions about like possible programs. There's all kinds of news websites, resources online. U.S. News and World Report publishes all kinds of lists of like top level U.S. universities and rank order. And they talk about all the different like programs and the benefits and the cost. So, uh, yeah, anybody who has questions about that or anything and like wants to know more, just reach out to us at Boundless or Rapid Visa. You know, we don't have, we don't uh, directly connect people with schools uh, and programs. Uh, we just help with the immigration part of the process. But, um, yeah, we, we're always happy to talk to customers and, and, and learn as much as we can about what you need to see if there's any way that we can help you. And uh, just a reminder, you know, Rapid Visa does have a student visa product where we, uh, we, we do provide some more detailed like interview preparation advice and some, uh, some, 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 some other tips and uh, assistance with the actual visa process that you may find valuable. I know, you know folks, some folks are denied for their student visas. That can be very upsetting, especially if you got your heart set on attending like a U.S. university. So in that case, you know, uh, reach out to us and uh, let's work together to see if there's a way that we can figure out to improve your interview technique and get yourself uh, to the program on time and safely, okay? So uh, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a great experience. Um, you know, I, I, I've studied abroad at different points. Um, I think a lot of people, it's really enriching experience, especially when you're younger, to go to another country and see what's out there and experience a different culture and academic environment. So if this is something that you're interested in pursuing, then uh, I really, really recommend it. And, uh, you know, everybody here at Boundless and Rapid Visa will do whatever we can to help you with that. All right. So with that being said, um, I got a couple of questions here that I wanted to take a look at. Um, some of these may not be student visa related, so uh, just bear with me here. But uh, okay, we had one question that said, "Hello, I'm getting married soon, and my fiance will be awaiting her green card without a work visa. Is there any possibility for her to work in the limbo period?" So, getting married and your fiance will be waiting. 
So short short answer is like you got to have some kind of authorization to work in the U.S. Right? There's really no other there's really no other alternative. If you don't have an employment authorization document, a green card, or some type of employment based visa, uh, or in, in, in some cases, uh, you're, if you're married to somebody who has a visa, you can get a visa that way and things like that. But yeah, for most people, like if we're not talking about things that you receive as part of the permission your spouse has or anything like that. Um, yeah, you, you will have to wait. And this affects a lot of people who are adjusting status, right? Like if you're in the United States and you came over on a B1, B2 or something like that and you get married uh, or you're coming out of student status and you want to go ahead and t- pick up a full-time job, even if you have married an American or you married a permanent resident, you're filing for your adjustment of status, you cannot work until you actually get that employment authorization document. That's why you file that I-765 form along with your I-485 form, Right. And I know that's that's hard. I know that's hard for people, right? Like it, it does happen that people like maybe they had an H-1B visa, but it's about to expire and they're about to apply for their 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 uh, green cards, you know, their family based green card because they married somebody. But, yeah, you need to have some kind of visa or, or permission to work. Um, and in some cases, that means that some people have to take a break for three or four months until their employment authorization document comes through. Does that feel good? No. And I think, you know, that's the U.S. government has acknowledged at different points that, like, the amount of time it takes to process these things is mm-hmm. causing, like, a lot of damage um, to people's ability to work and things like that, right? Um, and they've done a couple of things to try to address that. Like, I think renewals now, like, if you file the renewal, your actual, like, expired green card remains valid for, like, some period of time to cover the processing time it takes in between. Um, I, I recommend if somebody's in that position, go ahead and make the, Go to the USCIS website, uh, look up the employment authorization information and see what the policy is. It does change sometimes, right? Uh, luckily, in, the, in recent years, it's been changing to get more flexible. But the underlying problem is, you know, in a perfect world, at the point at which you're eligible for this stuff and you file the paperwork, you would just be able to start work, right? Because it's like until the government says no, which hopefully they won't do, it's like, you know, you should be eligible to have that benefit and uh, it should work that way. But in reality, even when you file the I-765 form, it can take five to seven months before you get that part of it done, leaving aside how long it eventually takes for your actual green card interview to be scheduled, which can be a year or more. So, you know, you have this sort of like in-between time where I know it's hard, and uh, but I, I really don't recommend that anybody, uh, you know, work without any author- without some kind of authorization in the U.S. Because even if you get away with it at the time and uh, you're able to somehow, you know, uh, your employer allows you to work or, you're, you know, you, you, you have some kind of credential that you use, um, you know, that that question will keep coming up in the immigration process. Now, for spouses of U.S. citizens, technically, you know, it's not going to cause an, 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 an ineligible. It's not an, that particular activity of working without authorization is not something that will cause you to be ineligible uh, when you adjust status in most cases. Now, that's a very general statement, and uh, there are some things that you can do around that to still get yourself in trouble. So, I, again, I don't recommend anybody get involved in that kind of activity. But, um, you know, if if, if 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 it's the case specifically for the spouse of a U.S. citizen that you did work un- unauthorized at some point and now you're trying to adjust status, you know, they're still going to want information about that, but you may be able to overcome that. Everybody else, it's going to cause a major problem for you. And it can come up when you adjust status. It can come up again when you're trying to get naturalized. It can come up when you apply for visas. And these are all problems that are going to be very hard for you to get, get to over, overcome if they find out that, that you were working without authorization. So don't do it. Um, all right. Uh, there's another question. How, hello, hello, sir. How long can I-130 take to approve for an LPR for a spouse outside the U.S.? These, these questions are really hard to answer, right? You're asking, like, there's a lot of variables in the processing time for some of these forms. Like, you, for uh, an LPR petitioner, so you have a green card, you, maybe you got married, something like that, and you're going to file an I-130 for your spouse. Uh, that person is located outside the U.S. It would depend on a lot of things, right? Like, where, what country are they in? Um, when did you file it? Uh, you, know, you know, like, what's the backlog look like? What's going on at USCIS in terms of, like, where they're processing things? So, in a general sense, like, you got to think about it like this, which is, like, Everything you do with USCIS, every form you file or whatever, that has to be processed somehow. Like, and it takes a certain amount of time. And like that may vary a little bit over time, but like it doesn't radically change um, except during COVID when it obviously shot up to a huge, huge degree. And I think they're still digging their, their way out of that right now. But, you know, so, so think about it like that. Like so the I-130 has to be processed. Say, say that takes 10 months. And during that time, uh, you, you're going to have to wait for USCIS to do their thing. 
Now, if USCIS approves the form, you should, should get a notification saying, like, hey, okay, we're, we're okay with this form, but now you have to go get a visa. Because again, according to this question, spouse is outside the U.S. Remember, we've talked about this. Inside the U.S., you adjust status. Outside the U.S., you need a visa to come back to actually enter the U.S. And, you know, in, you know, before COVID, you know, there was a wait, but like, I think most embassies and consulates in the world were able to like service these uh, ap visa applicants like pretty quick after USCIS approved their petition. But uh, the problem is, you know, as bad as things have gotten at USCIS because of uh, COVID backlogs, like uh, Department of State has been impacted even more severely, right? They have, they have hundreds of thousands of cases in their backlog and they're not doing a great job of digging out from under that. So uh, for the first time in a long time, a lot of people who get their I-130s approved now, yes, you had to wait for USCIS to, to do their thing. That's, that's baked in. You know, that's going to happen for the fiancé visa, the I-129F. It's going to happen with the I-130, I-140 um, employment-based uh, petition. But now you have to wait for Department of State to catch up as well. Now, there's some places in the world where they've done a pretty good job of catching up. Because, again, you have, to, you have to go for your visa interview in the place whatever country you're located in, usually the place that you're from. But if you're in a third country, you, you know, you would have indicated that when you filed your your uh, your petition. Now, um, there are a couple exceptions to this rule that I'll talk about in a second. But yeah, yeah in general, you're going to be waiting. You're going to wait for the uh, Department of State to reach out. Usually they'll do something pretty quick after the approval, which for especially for immigrant visas where they they, they have like the National Visa Center, which is located in the U.S., and that's kind of the clearinghouse where a lot of these petitions go after they leave USCIS. And those folks will reach out, and then they've got some people. They will look. They do some document collection and things to help prepare you for the actual interview with the consulate. Once you pass the NVC stage, uh, which can take you know a few weeks to a few months, depending on how, how organized your paperwork is and things like that, um, now you're waiting for the consulate to schedule an appointment. And if the consulate has a two-year backlog, then you're going to wait another two years. If the consulate's caught up, then you should get an interview pretty quick, usually a few months or a few weeks or months after that. Um, but yeah, I have heard, and we, we, we do have uh, customers at Boundless who are going through this right now where, you know, because of uh, staffing or because of uh, local country COVID rules, it just took a long time for them to get back to business and there's a long backlog. And um, unfortunately, there's not a really an easy way for you to know what these backlogs would be, right? Like State Department publishes some general numbers about like how long, you know, the, the wait times are. And like how many cases that they have pending. But, you know, unlike non-immigrant visas where the, the consulate does actually give you a, a projected, you know, oh, OK, we're, we're, it's going to take 30 days before you can get an appointment. Um, you know, which, again, would, for student visas, for example, you can find this out. Right. You go to the State Department, travel.state.gov. You find um, there's a tool there where you enter the consulate or embassy that you're going to apply at. And it'll give you a little readout that says, like, here's how long you have to wait right now for a tourist visa appointment. Here's how long you have to wait for a student visa appointment. And like usually, like, here's how long you know how, how long you have to wait for like every all the other visas like H1Bs or TNs, and um, that's usually a pretty up to date indicator. They they change they they keep that pretty up to date. For immigrant visas, yeah, it could be much harder to find out. They don't really publish a lot of statistics, and um, you really got to just play the waiting game. And uh, yeah, that can stretch out for quite a while. Now, one thing I've said before that I think is is is, is important is. You know, once it's overseas, uh, like at the consulate, it's they're a little bit more responsive usually. I think I've heard that this has changed during COVID now, and it's like less that less responsive than it used to be. But usually, they'll have some kind of like public facing email inbox or something that you could reach out to, and just you know, it, I mean, it's like doesn't doesn't hurt to try, right? And you could send them an email and say, hey, you know, this is my case number. Like I'm I'm trying to get a sense of like when this interview is going to be and stuff. Could you can you can you help me out? Um, you know, like, it'll be like, uh, I know they're usually like Guangzhou IV is, you know, or name, it'll be the name of the consulate or the embassy plus like immigrant visa or IV. And, um, yeah, they may have a couple of different things like this that they use for, for customer reach out or support. And, um, in, in countries where they use contractors for like scheduling and some of the appointment stuff like they do in Mexico, sometimes those folks will also have some idea of like what the wait times are and they can, you know, give you a little insight if you reach out to them. Um, Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. There was a question here, like, my boyfriend is on a work visa. He wants to live here in the States. We want to get married, uh, but we want to make sure we do everything right. What website do you recommend we take a look at? Well, uh, you're in luck. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work at Boundless to, to try to create uh, some content and resources that are very useful for people. And um, I think this is one thing that, that, that we've talked a bit about uh, in different articles and blogs and resources 
So, you know, quick internet search for boundless, um, you know, fiance marriage visa will give you a lot of content and articles that talk about this, all the different things around it, the forms you have to file, what you need to be careful about, what you need to pay attention to. Um, and I know it's a lot of material to read through. I mean, this is, you know, this is the reason our company exists and why we work so hard to, to make this process more, more easy and approachable is because it is really, really difficult to figure all this stuff out on your own. So, you know, after looking at some of that content, if you have some specific questions and things like that, feel free to reach out to our team. We have all our contact information on our Boundless website, Rapid Visa website. You know, we're happy to have a quick, quick conversation with you, talk it through. And uh, again, we're not lawyers and this is not legal advice, but, you know, we, we, we can answer simple questions and demystify some of the government uh, instructions so that you can have a clearer idea of where you need to go. And we're working really hard right now at, at Boundless to create uh, some tools that will help people understand exactly what they need as well. Uh, you know, like a quiz and some other things that can help people. I don't know, you know, a lot of people come to this approach, this, this, this process, they don't even know what visa they want or need or what they might even be eligible for. So there's a lot of people out there like that. And I know it's very challenging to like, you know, well, am I going to be a student? Like, should I try to get some kind of work visa? Like, how do I do that? So, uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're not alone. You know, there's a lot of people asking these questions and, uh, you know, the government for all, uh, I was in the government for many years, you know, I think they also do their best to make this system work within the constraints that they have in the U.S. laws. But, um, yeah, honestly, they don't do a very good, good job. And, uh, you know, people need support. Uh, you know, like I said, our, our company is focused on this. We have a lot of other uh, companies in this space that are, that, are, that are thinking about how to do this better. Um, you know, there's communities out there on social media and other places that can help support you. I would just say, just be careful because, you know, one thing that we do at Boundless is we're really, we go through a very rigorous process to make sure that the information that we're sharing is accurate and up to date. And a lot of what you'll hear through the grapevine online may not be correct. And, you know, it'd be really terrible if somebody acts on incorrect information to try to get something as important as a visa or a green card. That could really, really be a, be a, be a major problem for you if you, if you don't have the right, correct, the right information and guidance. So, you know, just just double check everything. Try to find a couple different sources. Ask questions. Like I said, our team's here to do what we can to help you understand what what the requirements are and how they work. And um, you know, at the end of the day, everybody uh, who is able to go through this process and get that green card in your hand, um, congratulations to you because uh, that's a major challenge. You know, and so I would even say it's tantamount to like you know graduating from a college program or or doing some kind of complicated like legal thing like like figuring out your taxes on your own. Um, it, it can be tough. So, so, uh, you know, good luck to everybody. And like I said, we'll, we'll do what we can to support. Okay. Uh, we're running up against the time limit a little bit here. And I think I covered most of the questions that we had. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I just want to thank everybody for ch chiming in today. Uh, I hope this was useful. We're going to keep doing these Q and A. So, uh, keep sharing your questions with us on social media and telling people, uh, about these events. Um, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that we get in advance. Uh, and we, you know, we try to make sure that the ones that come in through the chat, we have, a ch if we have time, we're able to address those. Um, so yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you everybody for your interest and support and, uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.